Lord, we thank you for the goodness and the kindness of God. You've done so much. Lord, we pause this moment in the presence of God. Do we thank you that it's all because of you? You have done it all. Lord, you have our hearts, you have our reverence this morning. And I pray that as we open the word of God for a little bit, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in us to teach us. May the ears of our hearts be opened. In Jesus' name, amen. We joined the church in 1988. I was just nine or 10. Um, We were Baptist, but the Baptist church was wanting to find renewal. And they called um, John and Hazel. I'm trying to get into the habit of calling them John and Hazel. Um, They called John and Hazel to come and lead them into renewal. You know, that was really quite a profound thing because they were saying, I don't think the church realised it, but the church was saying to the Lord, we want you to take us as a church and do whatever you want. Bring us into whatever you want. So the church kind of officially gave God permission to renew the church. I guess the people at peace back then, some of them are still here. I assume they thought certain things like we'll sing happier songs, we might speak in tongues. They they probably thought certain sets of things, but the Lord was thinking, I've got your permission. We are going to go on a way bigger journey than what you're thinking of. (laughs) And so it's been like that. It's been this giant journey. And um, it's the Lord. It, that whole journey, it's the Lord. And you don't know really what God's going to do, but he does many more bigger, grander things than what you could ever have imagined. Uh, one of the things that the church got into was the prophetic in the early years. And I was just, I grew up in the church. I was learning along with everyone else. And there were these prophetic conferences. We used to go off to Brisbane and other places to school of the prophets and uh, practice prophesying. And um, all of that were very fun times. There'd be people here that would remember all of those, those times. I remember we were in uh, Redcliffe. I think it was Redcliffe. And um, Chuck Clayton was the guest speaker. I think it was a Redcliffe conference. And... Um, the the gentleman that was in charge of organising the School of the Prophets was looking for some pastors that might take his special guests out to lunch all the different days so that his guests, like Chuck, would have, you know, get shouted lunch for one, but, uh, you know, that they would have interesting people to talk to. So he approached John and said, John, would you take Chuck out to lunch? And so they went to Sizzler's. I remember it because I was there. It was Chuck... And Dad, John, and me. And I thought this was great because we were going to Sizzlers. Uh, Chuck, I don't know who Chuck is, but ice cream bar, salad bar. I was in heaven. And uh, I look back on all this and I think, man, I was in at the ground floor. I didn't have a clue. I was just enjoying Sizzlers. Uh, (laughs) But um, there's been this whole journey of things that have happened. I remember Dad, John, preaching about the Lord's restoring apostles. I remember just being a teenager, sitting there thinking about that. Huh. Who who would have thought of that? You know, 12 apostles and we were done. But no, apparently we're not done. I remember thinking as about a 19-year-old, I think I'm an apostle. Definitely I'm an apostle. (laughs) And then I had some problems in life. And then I realised apostles have more problems in life. And then I decided I wasn't one. (laughs) This is all part of the journey. 
And as far as I'm concerned, unless the Lord says in black and white and big bold letters, very clearly, I am not one. And that's, I think, the attitude everyone should have. These are all part of the experiences. I was there the week that we had a, was supposed to be a week of hot, strong revival prayer that turned into a week of listening prayer. That was the week that I, that was the prayer meeting I tried to avoid as much as possible because it was really boring. And um, that's when my Bible college studies became way interesting that week. (laughs) So I've got to go study. So um, I was there. Holy, it was the Lord. It was the Lord. Um, I remember a conference in Toowoomba. Uh, We were invited by, John was invited by the Uniting Church in Toowoomba to come and do this intercession conference. I was there. I was a pastor in Mount Morgan at that point. I brought some people from my congregation and I remember we were sitting through a session on a Saturday afternoon where John talked about the unity of the body of Christ. I remember him saying that it was ridiculous that Christians could live on the very same street as each other and on a Sunday morning they would all get dressed in their fancy best dressed clothes and would all go off to church and one would go this way to the Presbyterian church and one would go that way to the Pentecostal church and they would hate each other's guts. But they were worshipping the same Lord and all doing the exact same thing all at the exact same time. And I remember him saying that that was ridiculous. Anyway, I remember the person that I'd brought from Mount Morgan with me sitting in the congregation next to me saying, this is amazing. I've never heard anything like this. And, um, but that was Toowoomba, what, 1990-something. There was no sign of any unity things going on. Like the apostles were preached, unity was preached, city eldership was preached. There was no sign of any of this stuff happening. But here we are, a mere 30 years later, the world's changed. It's the Lord. God has done things. You could not have imagined it. I mean, you could imagine it, but you couldn't imagine what he was going to do or how he was going to do it. It felt impossible, right? What I want to do this morning is I want to take you to the scriptures. I want to read, we're going to read an entire chapter over the course of this message. And we're going to make three points. And we're going to go to John chapter 21. And I'm, I'm actually quite amazed by this chapter in the Bible, John 21. It's the third time that Jesus appeared to the 12 disciples after he rose from the dead. But I'm amazed that this chapter can be summarised into my three points so perfectly. It's like God wrote it or something. It must be the Lord. So I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through to 7. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say that, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. It's the Lord. He leaped in. He had to get to him. It's the Lord. In nineteen. 1517, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door, it was the Lord. In 1522, when Christoph Frauscher ate sausages 
on a Friday in Lent, which was illegal in Switzerland, and was put in jail and started the Reformation in Switzerland, it was the Lord. When Count Zinzendorf's property was flooded with hundreds of Moravian refugees fleeing because they were being persecuted for being Christians, it was the Lord, but it led to a great revival. When William Carey went to India, despite everyone telling him he was mad, it was the Lord. He worked for 28 years, wrote the Bible, translated the Bible, and then a fire broke out in his house and burnt everything he had done to to smoke, to ashes. That was the Lord too. And he started translating again and produced an even better version of the Bible for the Indians. That was the Lord. When John Wesley was a two-year-old boy and his house caught fire and he nearly burnt to death, but someone pulled him out the window in the nick of time, that was the Lord. And when John Wesley was at Aldersgate Street one night and he heard the gospel preached and his heart was warmed, that was the Lord. When William Booth, as a teenager, got a job as an apprentice pawnbroker, that was the Lord. And in that place, he saw the alcoholics in the slums of London and his heart was moved and he started preaching to them. That was the Lord. On April the 3rd in 1960, when Dennis Bennett stood up in his church, an Episcopalian Anglican church, and told them he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he got kicked out of the denomination. And that was the Lord. And that was the start of the charismatic movement. It was a big part of the start of the charismatic movement. Before that, in 1901, when a one-eyed man called Willie Seymour, no joke, (laughs) preached in Los Angeles... William Seymour, (laughs) but I shortened it to Willie Seymour for the joke. (laughs) When a one-eyed man (laughs) preached in Los Angeles and the Holy Spirit poured out, that was the start of the Pentecostal movement, the Azusa Street Revival, that was the Lord. Thank God for that, you know, that African-American, that was a Pentecostal, pick LA, who would have picked LA for a move of the Holy Spirit? Think of the world we're living in now. Would the Lord do anything in LA? Hard to imagine, right? No. No, that's where the Pentecostal movement began. And African-American worship spread all around the world and changed worship everywhere. Thank God for gospel music. That was the Lord. In the early 1990s, when John Alley sat down at Sizzler's with Chuck Clayton for lunch and David Alley enjoyed the salad bar, (laughs) that was the Lord. Seriously. In 1997, when the Lord appeared to John and gave him an apostolic commission, that was really the Lord. There's a lot of examples I could pick. The Lord's been doing a lot of things. Um, the things that have been shared this weekend about walking in relationships, about the restoration of apostles, some of the things you've heard many times, but they've all been shared this weekend, about becoming a people who love one another, about working together with other churches, about giving up your rights. I don't think that was specifically talked about, but that's definitely a part of it. All of these things are the Lord. I think there's four things you can say about that. You know the disciples are on the beach, uh, they're in the boat, Jesus is on the beach. He doesn't look like Jesus. They don't recognise him. But John realises it's the Lord. Why didn't he look like Jesus? I don't know why he didn't look like Jesus. Probably his resurrection body was just a bit different. And one day you and I will have resurrection bodies and we'll be an even better version of ourselves. We probably won't look exactly like what we look like right now. That's a physical reason why maybe. I don't know why, but maybe the Lord didn't let them recognise him. Because it makes a great point. God does things in our lives and we don't always know it's him. But it is him. 
Sometimes things happen that don't look like the Lord, but they are. Like when your print shop burns to the ground and 28 years of Bible translation go up in smoke. It doesn't look, doesn't look like the Lord, but it is. So the first of these four quick points for that. Now, remember I said it's going to make three points, but these are four sub-points of the first point, just so that you're clear. <laughs> the first point is that it's the Lord. But there are four sub-points. One, sometimes we don't recognise him, but it is him. Number two, that he is at work doing things among us, even if you don't see it. Number three, if he was not there, nothing would happen. If Jesus was not there on the beach that morning, they would not have caught any fish. And number four, they actually worked. Jesus worked, but they worked. They did it together. So this calling that we have that's apostolic, it's something that Jesus is in. You don't always recognise him. If he's not there, nothing happens. But we have to work and he will work with us. Just like that first seven chapters of John chapter 21. But if you think about the phrase, it is the Lord, there are other ways of understanding it. There are two other ways I thought of. It could be a lot. But there are at least three ways of thinking of this phrase, it is the Lord. And they're my three points. So the first point, it is the Lord, the one that I've already made, is he is the cause. Everything that happens is because of him. It's because of the Lord. But the second point is about him. He's a person. It's the Lord. Verses 8 to 14. The other disciples followed in the boat, because, you know, Peter had already leaped into the ocean, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? So he told you he looked a little bit different. They knew it was the Lord because they knew him. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus is the cause of everything that happens. It's because of the Lord. But he's also the focus of everything. He's the one we love. He's our Lord. Remember, John has told the story many, many times of the night that the Lord stood before him and gave him an apostolic commission. And what did he say? You all remember it, surely. You've heard it many times. Take an apostolic message to the nations. Remain the leader of the church at home. Obviously, that didn't mean forever because, you know, people at some point will go to heaven. So it was for the moment. And the third thing, keep looking into the eyes of Jesus because he's the Lord. He's our God and we love him. So the first point is that everything's because of him. The second point is it's everything is about him. We love him. What's the point of building the biggest church in the world if it's not about him? What's the point of going to Africa and, you know, visiting all those pastors if it's not about him? What's the point of doing anything if it's not about him? He is the Lord. The third 
point is also the same. He is the Lord. <laughs> Let's read verses 15 to 24. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He said, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. By the way, do you know what that means? Stretch out your hands. Crucifixion. When you're old, you'll be crucified. You'll stretch out your hands. Someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, as John, was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him... He said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. And we know that his testimony is true. Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Yes, he does, three times. Then he tells him what to do. Feed my sheep, follow me, and when you're old, this is what's going to happen to you. Peter's immediate thoughts are, what about these other disciples? If I'm going to get crucified, what about him? And Jesus says, this is just a between you and me thing. What I do with them is something else. He's the Lord. So yes, he's the Lord, point one, because it, he's the cause of everything that happens. He's the Lord, point two, because it's all about him. But he's the Lord, point three, because he's the Lord. He will tell you what you're going to do. It's about you. It's between you and him. And what he does with other people is none of your business. You might say, well, what about so-and-so? They've got a nice life. They've got good cars and a business and they're doing well. And What is that to you? If the Lord wants them to have nice things, what is that to you? He's the Lord. If the Lord says he wants you to stretch out your hands and if he leads you to a place where you do not want to go, which is what he said to Peter... He is the Lord. I don't know who had it worse. John had some pretty tough experiences to go through. Why do we always worry about what other people... Why are we always trying to compare ourselves to others? This apostolic thing is all about him. It's what he's doing. For some of you, 
He'll call you to travel and go to the, to the nations like John or like Lloyd. For others, he'll call you to do something else. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Don't be grumpy or bitter because you're not getting what you want. That's not an apostolic value at all. Jesus is the first apostle. You know that, right? I counted all the apostles in the Bible once. I wrote an article about it. It's on the Peace website. How many apostles are there in the Bible? You can Google it. There are 25. Jesus is the first one. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it says, He is the apostle and confession of our apostle and high priest of our confession. He's the first apostle because the Father in heaven said to him, I'm sending you. And it says in Philippians chapter 2 that he did not cling to his rights as God. It's so strange in the world today. Everyone's talking about their rights. I've got my rights. Everyone's fighting about their rights. It's just not Christian at all to talk like that. Jesus did not cling to his rights but laid them down. He wasn't even just giving up being God and becoming a person. It was humbling himself to the cross. So if God calls you to lay down your life, so be it. You'd only be doing the example, he'd only be following the example he set for you. And if there was anyone who had a right to say they didn't have to go through that, it would be him. So Peter really had no choice. I, mean, I guess he had a choice. He could have said, stuff this, I'm just going to go. But it would have meant turning his back on the Lord. Well, that's no choice. So the Lord determines what he wants from you. It may not seem fair, it may seem hard or unreasonable at the beginning, but he is the Lord. I think I'm going to invite the band to come. And um, there are these three ways of thinking about this passage. Everything that the Lord has done. In your life, think about your own life, the journey that you've been on. The Lord has been in it. He's brought you to this place today. I think one of the big struggles we have as people is we want to be significant. But it seems to me that's the complete opposite value of being apostolic. What people think is, oh, apostles, this is my chance to be significant. But the whole idea of being apostolic is actually to be insignificant. So it's the complete opposite of what you think. And if you've thought that by getting involved with peace, somehow you're going to get more significance, I think you're wrong. If you thought that this apostolic movement was going to lift you up to some grand place and people were going to notice you, probably wrong about that too. The Lord does do that for some people. He lifts them up, like, you know, Martin Luther and William Carey and those people I named. But if the Lord lifts up some and doesn't lift up you, what is that to you? He is the Lord. So I think what I'm calling you to do this morning is to become a bit more apostolic. And by that, what I mean is give up all your hopes and dreams and aspirations and realise that apart from him, you've got none. 
If he wants anything from you or if he wants to give you anything or put you in any grand place, it's because he wants it, not because you want it. And if he wants it, it's because he needs it for some reason. And then it's not about you either. It's never about you. So I think the moment has come at the end of this summer to lay everything down and say it's not about me. It's all about him because he's the Lord. I don't know if we have a nice song we can sing, but as we do sing something, get down on your knees. There's no room up the front for everyone, but there's room on your knees where you are. So get on your knees and say, Lord, it's all yours. My life, my hopes, my family, my dreams, my money, my aspirations, my future, my desires to be important. And say, Lord, whatever you want of me, that's what I want for me too. Pray that while we're singing this song.